Hello fam, Merry Christmas. Wherever you are and whoever you are with, I pray that you'll be aware of God's presence and that you'll be in awe once again as we study the story of the birth of Jesus Christ, our Messiah. What a beautiful day. I hope that this video will bless you and I hope that you can take some time now, either alone or with your people, to work through Isaiah 9 with me and to gaze at the wonder of the birth of Jesus Christ. Let me read Isaiah 9 for us, verses 1 to 7. It reads as follows. Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan and to Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time and as they rejoice when dividing spoils. For you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. For every trampling boot of battle and the bloodied garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord. Indeed, the light has come. Christmas is about the light of Jesus Christ breaking into the darkness. And fact and truth, all our longings are met in the Messiah. Now, good question. How do we know this? The text that I just read to us from Isaiah 9 will teach us news of the Messiah, the nature of the Messiah, and then will also amplify our need for the Messiah. Let me pray for us. And then we'll jump right in and study and see what all of these things mean. Lord Jesus, what a beautiful, beautiful day to know that your birth fulfilled promises that was made way back. Thank you that we can celebrate it again today. Even though we are scattered as a church, I pray that you would unify us through the watching of this video and that you would uh, illuminate our thoughts as we study your word today. You are indeed a great, great Messiah. And we, uh, we are privileged by your grace to be able to know you and to be in a relationship with you and to once again experience this as good news. I pray that the words spoken today will fall on fertile soil, Lord God, and that it would bear much fruit. Speak to us now as we open up your word. We pray that in your name. Amen. The news of the Messiah, found in verses 1 to 5. Let me show you some highlights from the text, and then we'll work through those highlights as we uh, study it together. The word nevertheless is important because it links this chapter of Isaiah to a previous chapter. You'll see that it says, it will not be like, but in the future it will then you have this beautiful poem with all of these contrasts and these beautiful descriptive words. So darkness and light, the word light again, and then the word darkness again. And then you will see enlarged the nation, increased its joy. People have rejoiced. Harvest time, a time when they are dividing spoils. All of these are really, really important because it has to do with the news of the Messiah. Then you'll see someone has shattered something, and that someone is you. That's God speaking through his Messiah coming. And then there's a story that they are reminded of 
the day of Midian, we'll look at that. And then you'll see this strange but beautiful line that boots and garments will be burned as fuel for the fire. Now let's work through the text. Firstly, something was going on prior to this chapter, and that is that judgment was pronounced to the north. It was said that at the hands of the Assyrians, the northern part of Israel will fall. Isaiah 8 verse 22 says, They will look toward the earth and see only distress, darkness, and the gloom of affliction, and they will be driven into thick darkness. If you want to read the rest of chapter 8, you can. It gives the reasons for why the people of Israel find themselves in this position. Now it says, where will this light be found? The words used in our teaching text is the Galilee of nations, or you can also translate it as the Galilee of Gentiles or of the Gentiles. And that's a shocking statement, because if you think about it, if God was going to do something big, why doesn't he go to the divine headquarters in Israel, which is Jerusalem? Instead, he goes deep, deep rural. Why? Well, whenever Israel was attacked, it was usually in the northern part of the country. So enemies would march through what they call the Fertile Crescent. It looked like a half a moon. And then they would invade Galilee. And Galilee was situated in the north of Israel. So the people of Galilee uh, had a history of slavery. They had a history of despair. And this means that God, through his Messiah, in his great act of salvation, came to his people first where his people had suffered the most. That's the area uh, that will be first to see the light of the Messiah. Phenomenal now, isn't it? Also, it says they have seen. The prophet speaks in what they call the perfect tense. The prophet says that something will happen, but he's so certain that it will happen, he speaks as if it has happened already. Brilliant now, isn't it? It will happen. They will see the light. They have seen the light, the prophet says. And then he carries on to explain that God is spreading out this light to more and more people. It says he enlarged the nation. And you and I know from previous sermons and also from reading the Bible that one day um, God's family will be made up of people of every tribe, language, and nation. Revelation 7 Verse 9, God has also increased the nation's joy. And then he says, just as at harvest time, just as when they are dividing spoils. He uses metaphors that the people know, moments they know, moments they can feel, moments they can imagine, moments they can relate to. If we look at verse 4 and 5, it says God's deliverance will be like Gideon's victory over the Midianites, which was, if you think back of the story found in Judges 6 to 8, the result of God fighting for his people. Now, let's just pause here for a second. Gideon was an unlikely hero, and he won in an unlikely way. Can you recall the story? With torches, and trumpets, uh, they threw their enemy into a panic, and that actually led the enemy to slaughter themselves. Crazy story, but awesome story. Why? Because this pattern sets forth in the Old Testament a, a pattern that comes to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Think about it. He's also an unlikely hero who would set the captives free in an unlikely way. And that unlikely way was through death. God turns the wisdom of the world on its head. He does things his way. And then it says in verse 5, even boots and garments, not just weapons, but their clothes as well, will burn. That's a way of saying war will cease. That's a way of saying nothing that could possibly remind us of war would be there anymore because war will fully and finally cease. Just think about that for a moment, fam. The Messiah will burn the boots of our enemies, our enemies being Satan, sin, 
and death. And he will burn everything that would remind us of that war we have with our enemies. Unbelievable, isn't it? So how will all of this come about? And who will this deliverer be? Now Isaiah tells us. So he's spoken about the news of the Messiah in verses 1 to 5. And now he is going to speak about the nature of the Messiah in verses 6 and 7. Let me just show you some highlights again, just to make sure that we uh, follow along. So look at verses 6 and 7. A child, this child is a son. It speaks about being born and being given. And then it says what this child will do, will carry the government on his shoulders. And then we see something about the names of this child. So first it's birth, and then it's names. And then after it's names, we also see in verse 7 something about his kingdom. Right, so there you go. We'll speak about wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal father, and prince of peace as well. And then there's a little nugget hidden there in the word zeal in the end. We'll get there too um, as we work through the text. Okay, so let's look at his birth first. His birth points to his humanity. A child, a son, born like a baby, vulnerable, small, Fully human, the Apostle Paul says in Galatians, is born of a woman. It means just like everyone else. But even though it points to his humanity, it also points to his deity. That means the fact that he's also God while he is a human, because it says that he will be given. So he comes from somewhere, given to us by someone for something specific. Paul says in Galatians 4 that God sent forth his son to be the son that all of his sons were supposed to be. Are you tracking with me? Jesus was going to be the ultimate son, the Messiah. God's grace is underscored for us, actually, and amplified in this piece. Do you see it says for us? There we go. That's Christmas. Christmas is about grace. Now, for Jesus Christ to change you, you must receive him by grace through faith. That's the ultimate gift, is God's gift to us in his son, Jesus Christ. I don't know if you've ever had this experience around Christmas time, but some gifts make you swallow your pride a little bit because you have to admit that you need the gift before you can be thankful for it. Just imagine for a minute, whether you are a man or a woman, what if someone gave you a case of deodorant for this Christmas? I mean, nice gift, but why exactly would this person give me a case of deodorant? Might it be that I need it? Might it be that I am a little bit smelly? And might it be that I have to humble myself, admit that I'm a little bit smelly, and then appreciate the gift that was given to me? You are only thankful for these kind of gifts if you, if you realize and confess and think that you need them. Now, just ponder this for a second, fam. God didn't send a physical trainer into the world for us. He didn't send a life coach into the world for us. He didn't send a politician into the world for us. He sent a savior. Why? Because that is what we needed. And he graciously provided him to us. Humanity might have wanted something else, but in the end, God gave us the ultimate gift, what humanity needed the most. So for Jesus Christ to change us, we must swallow our pride and we must call out to him to save us. We must admit that we are sinners and then give up control of our lives to Jesus. Jesus himself said in the beginning of his ministry, my message is simple, and that is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent means turn, headed in an opposite direction of where you were heading. And this next sentence in our teaching text tells us that Christ is 
fully sufficient to save us. So these four names that we see in Isaiah 9 um, are names that show more of God's unique identity. Fam they are titles that can only be given to God. Let's study them. First one, Wonderful Counselor. Now, throughout Isaiah, Isaiah, the prophet laughs at human counsel. Humans don't know what they're talking about. He says that again and again. And often when he says that, he contrasts it with the superiority of God's counsel. Take a look at, as an example, Isaiah 8, uh, verse 29. He says this false wisdom of Israel's misguided leaders. Therefore, we should look to him as our counselor. We should build our life on his word. Then do you realize that Jesus Christ, through his spirit currently living inside of us, that's if you are a Christian, that he is always with us. Your spiritual leaders or your counselors or your disciples can't be with you all the time to counsel you, but Jesus can. Your friends, your parents, your confidants, they can't be with you all the time, but Jesus can. A wonderful counselor. We shouldn't look for counsel in the wrong place because counsel is to be found in him, the Messiah. Let's look at the words mighty God. This expression always refers to God himself. Only he can get that title. The baby born in Bethlehem, the one that we're celebrating today, is the mighty God. Think about it. Baby in a manger. But the truth and the reality is that he's able to take care of everything. Baby in a manger, but his enemies are no match for him. Baby in a manger, he will win. He is superior. <laughs> what a name. What a title. What a wonderful Messiah we have. Everlasting Father. Everlasting Father, in this portion of Scripture, talks about the Messiah, which we now know is Jesus Christ, uh, the love he has for us, like a father, tender and merciful. If you think about the gospel accounts, we'll see Jesus himself calling individuals, son and daughter, with a lot of affection. Think Matthew 9 and Mark chapter 5. And everlasting shows his deity, not only for a short while, but forever and ever and ever and ever. Fourth one, Prince of Peace. This prince will bring total peace. This prince will bring total shalom, is the Hebrew word, where no one or nothing is lacking anything. Everything and everyone is made whole. That's what the word refers to. Now, this is something that earthly princes could never, ever do. Now, think about this. Jesus Christ brought peace by reconciling enemies to the Father. That's us sinners separated from the Father. He did this through his death on the cross. And now Jesus gives us the experience of peace as we trust him. So Jesus gives us peace with God. He allows us to experience the peace of God here and now in the midst of everything that we're facing. And one day he will bring universal peace, fulfilling the promises of God. Fam, do you know this peace? Like, are you at peace today? Have you found that secret to contentment and experiencing God's peace that he's given us? that he will fulfill one day, I think that's worth pausing. And the nice thing is that this is a video, so you can actually pause and ponder before we continue. So Isaiah 9 tells us of the ultimate king and the ultimate kingdom. And in this king's kingdom, there will be no more injustice in the world. That's great news. There will be an end to every other kingdom in this world. Think about our history, but not 
an end to this kingdom. Now, a good question would be, who guarantees that this kingdom will come? How do we know? Look at the last line. It says, the zeal of the Lord of armies will make this happen, will accomplish this. Now, what is the zeal of the Lord of armies? Alistair Begg, a theologian, says, this zeal is God's passionate commitment to bring about his redemptive purposes. And then Alistair Begg says, God's plans are not a last minute respond to world, uh, sorry, a last minute response to world events. That's great news now, isn't it? God is not cold and indifferent towards us or the history of the world. No, 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 no. He is zealous. Fam, God knows only one way to love us. That's Christians, his children. And that is with zeal and passion and wholeheartedness. And may I remind you that that is actually also the way that we are to love him with passion. Isaiah proclaims this light to the people. And he proclaims this light to, uh, this light to people in desperate need of hope in desperate need of salvation, in the midst of a very dark world. Fam, today, now, in the dark world that we live in, we know that the light has come, and we know that he will come again. So my invitation to you, my exhortation to you, my piece of admonishing to you is, Behold your Savior. Light has come. May I remind you, as our wonderful counselor, he has wisdom. Listen to him. As our mighty God, he defeats our enemies easily. Rejoice in him. As our everlasting father, he loves us with a tender and an eternal love. Enjoy him experience it, revel in it, let him lavish you in his everlasting love. And as our Prince of Peace, we should remember that we've been reconciled to God, we've been reconciled to one another, and we look forward to the day in which we can enjoy total shalom in a new heavens and a new earth. Fam, we should welcome this peace. We should anticipate this peace. Merry Christmas. I want to make a suggestion, and that is to read the account of the birth of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verse 1 to 21, after watching this video. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, everlasting Father, our Prince of Peace, thank you for coming into this world. Thank you for being the ultimate gift. Thank you for bringing us salvation, that which we needed so much. Thank you for light in darkness. Thank you that you've won the battle. And thank you that we can be part of this whole new mode of existence by grace through faith in you that we can be reconciled to the father and reconciled to one another i pray lord jesus as we gaze at you today in the manger as we hear the angels sing as we see the shepherds receive the news that we'll once again be in awe of who you are and that we'll be very aware of our need for you. Bless us on this Christmas day and Christmas Eve in 2023. I pray that in your name. Amen.